Here, in the rugged heart of Tasmania, nature has left the stamp of her timeless beauty. And stamps indeed once conveyed this island's beauty around the world. These stamps were issued before the turn of the century, before engineers had fully penetrated the highlands and found that in the picturesque scenery was a wealth of power. Today, electricity flows from the highlands to supply industries, towns and cities. Tasmania's attractions for the tourists are many, and in big numbers the tourists come, crossing from the Australian mainland in a seagoing ferry, the Princess of Tasmania. As well as passengers, the ferry brings tourists, cars and caravans, an ideal way to travel into the heart of Tasmania onto the roof of this isle of green mountains and vast waterways. Trout are the tempting lure for many, and Isaac Walton's complete angler never had better fishing than the islands, lakes and rivers provide. In every direction, scenic spots beckon. Even the visitor on foot can find his fill of beauty round the shores of Lake St. Clair, gateway to a large national park in the Highlands. Nearby is a lake entirely man-made, Lake King William, bottled behind a massive dam across the throat of Butler's Gorge. For the tourists, free to visit the constructions in the highland areas, the dams and power stations add a touch of novel beauty to the timeless scenes of nature. The works have a feeling of grace and power akin to the rugged strength of the countryside itself. Two hundred feet below the dam is the power station. It's one of nearly a dozen which the Tasmanian Hydroelectric Commission has built over the past three decades. Full use is made of the highland streams. Some of the waters of the Derwent River system are used five times over in the various power schemes. Brady's Lake, once the hideout of a bushranger named Brady, is now harnessed to the network of lagoons and waterways that comprise the electricity system. This is the variety of the Tasmanian Highland Circuit, the undisturbed bush, the placid lagoon, but just around the corner or through the trees, always the works of man to add interest to the visitor's tour. A network of pipelines and canals links the natural water resources into a controlled flow of power for the generating stations. The roads the construction men built are the legacy left to the traveller freely to use. The building of the electricity schemes has meant the opening up of the highlands to all comers. Lake Echo, now a fisherman's paradise, offering rainbow and brown trout, was unknown till a hydroelectric dam was built to store water. Not only pastime and travel, but rest and accommodation are provided through the hydroelectric developments. Bronte Park stands at the crossroads of the highlands. Once a bustling construction camp, it now provides amenities for anglers and visitors touring the nearby chain of lakes. The chalet is as pleasant as a holiday lodge 
and for fishermen, there's the chance to taste the result of the day's catch. In the highlands, a big staff operates the power stations, and Taralia village is a self-contained township where many of them live. It's a town hewn from the virgin bush and standing on the rim of a gorge. But life here follows the typical pattern of a modern community. Taralia provides all the amenities of a small town, with its own school, picture theatre and modern shopping centre. For visitors, there's the Taralia Chalet. And nearby, an observation point which gives a dramatic glimpse down onto the Taralia power station below. Six steel penstocks plunge a thousand feet down the gorge, feeding a tremendous force of water into the station's turbines. A few hundred yards away on the opposite side of the gorge is another power station, Tungatina. Smartly laid out in lawns and gardens, Tungatina, like the other stations in the Tasmanian grid, is open to the public. In cars and tourist coaches, the visitors come in regular parties. Tungatina alone has an installed capacity of 175,000 horsepower, a gigantic force drawn from the natural power of tumbling mountain water. Part of the power station is the spinning turbine shaft, as delicately balanced as the spindle of a watch. From Tungatina, the water passes on down the gorge, joining the water from Taralia power station to be used again at Liaputa. Here, a giant steel gate operating like a drum releases water when the river level rises. From the Liaputa Dam, the water flows through a four-mile tunnel under a hill to emerge in the pipes that descend into Liaputa Power Station. Nearby is Weyatina Village, living centre for the Power Station staff and port of call for many tourists on the Highland Circuit. Its caravan park, tennis courts and swimming pool add a touch of luxury to mountain living. Stored in a big lagoon, the water is held for use yet again, this time in the Weyatina power station. The Tasmanian network is a chain of power stations linked by the rivers, tunnels and canals that channel water to them. Higher up, on the central plateau, two-thirds of a mile above sea level, is Great Lake. Sixty square miles in area, it's Australia's largest natural freshwater lake. On its shore, the Maina Hotel caters for a big passing trade of sportsmen and tourists. From a dam at the southern end of Great Lake flows the Shannon River, often the scene of spectacular fly fishing.
Great Lake was one of the first sources of hydroelectric power in the Southern Hemisphere. And now it's one of the newest. At the northern end, engineers are working on Tasmania's biggest power project, the Poatina scheme. Poatina is an Aboriginal word for cave, and the new power station is to be housed in a huge underground cavern. Beyond the western tiers, a northern rampart of mountains, lies the Midland Plain. And it's down these tiers that a spectacular new access road has been opened for Poatina. Not only do the mountains and lakes give Tasmania its essential character, but they equip it with the power for growth and expansion. For much of the island's economy rests on the spinning turbines of its hydroelectric stations. <laughs> 